Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our SDSU Extension Master Gardener webinar today. I am Prairie Walkling, uh, SDSU Extension Master Gardener Program Manager. And today's presentation is a special continuing education opportunity that's offered to our Master Gardener volunteers and also um, open to the public. This session will be recorded and the recording will be available on YouTube afterwards. Uh, for those of you joining us live, if you have questions, please type those in the Q&A box, or you can type those in the chat. Um, for most of you, that Q&A button will be at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see it, you might need to expand your screen view. And we welcome those questions from you. We'll address the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Today, we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Esther McGinnis, speaking on the NDSU Extension Master Gardener Pollinator Program, Education, Research, and Impacts. And also presenting today are Shannon Eaker, and uh, who's Master Gardener Program Assistant, and April Johnson, NDSU Extension Pollinator Technician. Uh, I have a, a brief bio um, from Dr. McGinnis, and I'm sorry I don't have a bio for Shannon or April, uh, but, but they can share a little about themselves. Uh, Dr. Esther McGinnis is an associate professor in the North Dakota State University Department of Plant Sciences. She's also an extension horticulturalist and director of the NDSU Extension Master Gardener Program. Her graduate students conduct research in the areas of native plant evaluation, pollinator conservation, and plants for rain garden environments. As the administration, excuse me, administrator of the Extension Master Gardener Program, impactful initiatives include planting pollinator habitat, fighting food insecurity, community beautification, and plant diagnosis. Welcome to Esther, Shannon, and April. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Prairie. And, and thank you to thank you for inviting us. We were originally scheduled to give this talk during the Master Gardener update in Spearfish, I believe in September. And unfortunately, COVID went right through my family and I got sick. So uh, we were not able to come. So we apologize for that. But I'm just glad that we have this other opportunity. And I want to thank Prairie because we have really enjoyed working with Prairie and, and getting to know her. So it's just great that we're able you know, to share resources and collaborate on projects. So today I'm talking about the Master Gardener Pollinator Program, and this will be a different presentation. I'm not going to tell you how to build a pollinator program. I'm talking more along the lines of this as a project that can be done by Master Gardener volunteers and what that all entails. <clears throat> Uh, well, first of all, we've got our non-discrimination statement that we show for every presentation, and I'm sure that you have that um, with SDSU also. Uh, but starting off with our program, we're going to give you a little bit of background before I turn this over to Shannon to present. We've got uh, somewhere between 350 and 400 members. And of course, that fluctuates. We have some that retire. And then, of course, we bring on new Master Gardener interns. So we have three classes of Master Gardeners. We have our interns that are just taking the class and working on their volunteer hours. We have our certified volunteers and our Master Gardener diagnosticians. And they are in 37 out of the 51 counties. And they're loosely supervised by extension agents. And I say loosely because our extension agents, I would say, are, are quite overworked. They, there are some agents that are running 4-H. They're, you know, giving advice on livestock, you know, crop and weed and horticulture. Um, so, so while we do have supervision, um, we, we, we understand that they're not going to be able to give this as much time as we would necessarily want. Now, the purpose of the Extension Pollinator Program is we wanted to provide structured 
volunteer opportunities for our master gardeners. And this would also make it easier for those extension agents that are supervising their projects um, because we've got all the infrastructure in place for them. Secondly, this provides a method to transfer funds uh, from our state office to our county master gardener programs. Um, I had talked with Prairie yesterday about this, and we can't just write a check and send it to county extension. Our state auditors require us to reimburse for expenses. We can't just give a chunk of money to the program. So this is another way that we can provide money, but we reimburse for the expenses of actually building a pollinator program. And then probably our most important purpose is pollinator conservation. And, and of course, taking into account the economic impact of bees to North Dakota. And that goes right into my next slide. Um, North Dakota is number one in honey production. We've got close to 750,000 colonies spread across the state. And uh, we produce over 30 million pounds of honey, which in 2022 was the equivalent of $81 million. Uh, and this doesn't take into account the pollination services. Our beekeepers take our bees to overwinter in California and Arizona and Florida, where they pollinate you know, the, um, the almond crop and other crops that require bees or are benefited by bee pollination. However, pollinators are much more than our imported European honeybee. The Master Gardener program is very, very much interested in conserving wild bee diversity in North Dakota. Um, we've got 318 species of wild bees that have been documented, um, but I would say that's on the low side. We haven't had enough research on that. I would love to see more surveys. I bet we're closer to 400 different species and you know that includes our our little bumblebees i like to call the, them flying teddy bears and in fact one of my one of my associates knows which bumblebee she can actually pet there are some that are less aggressive than others now i haven't gotten i haven't gotten that bold yet but they're they're not as hostile as you think um, we've got, you know, green sweat bees, we've got mason bees, mining bees, digger bees, cellophane bees, you name it. Lots of diversity. And I encourage you as you walk through your gardens, you know, to see the diversity in bees because they're not, they're not just all honeybees or bumblebees. <clears throat> So in addition to conserving our bees, we're also worried about butterflies and moths. And I get a lot of questions, are monarchs endangered? Now monarchs have been in the news quite a bit. Um, and technically monarchs are not listed as endangered in the United States. It's only the US Fish and Wildlife Service that has the authority to do that. However, monarchs are listed on the IUCN red list. This is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And while they do not have any authority over the United States, they do provide, <clears throat> they do provide a warning that monarchs are in fact decreasing in numbers. So I'm gonna be turning the microphone over to Shannon here. And Shannon is gonna talk about the first of our four phases. Today, we're gonna to talk about the four phases of our pollinator project. And Shannon and I have been working together for 10 years. And oh my goodness, it's been a very happy partnership. Thanks, Esther. Yeah, it is. It's an amazing job to do and an amazing person to do it with. So um, so in keeping with um, our, our concerns about pollinator insects, uh, we kind of started building some programming to uh, create some habitat and teach folks about pollinators. So uh, the first thing we did, we were able to do was offer grants to our master gardeners uh, that they applied for and then would get reimbursed for those expenses through the grant dollars. Um, we had funding sources both from some programming dollars and then also the USDA and so you can see here a picture of one of our teaching garden signs in place. Uh, the grants were, are awarded to master gardeners based on their 
ability to work with their extension agent to secure a public location where the garden can be um, used for touring and teaching. Uh, and their agreement to use native and ornamental plants from a list that Esther created to um, make sure that things are constantly in bloom within the garden. So constant food for our pollinators. So far, we have funded uh, over 30 gardens in 20 counties in North Dakota, and we have started offering maintenance grants. So along with new gardens that come uh, every year, we offer smaller amounts of money to uh, replant, transplant, just upkeep and maintenance of gardens. Um, you can visit our gardens and take a digital tour. Uh, thanks, April. Just dropped in a link for us there that will take you to this map. And by clicking on the flower, you will be taken to that garden's digital location. And within that, you can flip through the photos that are listed there so that you can see several photos of the garden. Uh, along with the grant funding, we needed to provide some resources to help our master gardeners learn how to build the best pollinator garden, as well as tools for them to teach within the pollinator gardens. So these are a few of the resources that we have available online. You're welcome to use them as well. Some of these were done in collaboration with other groups at North Dakota State University, some with Michigan State University. And the newest one uh, shown here, the Monarch Butterfly Migration Cycle, it is on its way to the internet very soon. Um, along with the printable documents, we also have a customizable PowerPoint that master gardeners can use to kind of do maybe an indoor review of some tools and learning, learning, and then you go out into the garden and do a tour. Uh, there are children's lessons that can be done indoors or outdoors, so you can work in the garden, or if it's rainy, you still have something that you can teach. Um, and then we offer continuing ed education to our master gardeners to make sure that they're keeping up with the latest pollinator news. Uh, here are some photos. Um, oh, this just does my heart good. You can see one of our master gardeners doing a, a teaching module at a uh, library, and then they moved into the garden following the module. Uh, the the lower picture is actually a felted piece of artwork that one of our master gardeners made to show bee homes. So you can see how uh, bees make their little home and then break out of the little the little shell of the capsules that open there. Um, so I just loved the like her taking her other hobby, felting, and bringing it with pollinators. And then you can see some uh, students putting in a pollinator garden. So some help there. And the middle picture is a youngster just being enamored by a monarch. And actually the older gentleman holding the monarch was equally enamored. It was adorable. <laughs> uh, we've gotten some pub publicity for doing this work, which it always is good, right? It helps people know where the gardens are and keeps our master gardeners excited to continue doing the work. Feedback is always good. And so after we started building these gardens and, and teaching in them, we thought we would reach further out to individual homeowners to see if we could get them on board. So I will give it back to Esther. Great, thank you, Shannon. So just a second, let me get this going here. <clears throat> so after we had built our gardens um, and had created all these resources, this is where we got to the really fun part of the project. So we in Extension, our purpose is not just to educate, but it also is to bring about transformational change. So to inspire homeowners to in fact build <clears throat> build pollinator gardens is a part of what we do. 
And as an incentive, we do offer a certification and a sign to homeowners. But it's really not just homeowners. You could um, you could be a business owner, or you could be a nursing home, a church. It really didn't. It doesn't matter what uh, what your designation is. Um, but we'll give you a, a free sign if you build a new pollinator garden or if you retrofit an existing garden and add pollinator friendly plants and meet our other requirements. So we have an online application and the online application, you'll, you can see the link on the left hand side there. So that's the link to the Master Gardener program, but we've got um, We've got a tab for home pollinator garden and bee lawn signs. So that's where our online application lives. And on the form, we've got, we've got the option of selecting plants from each time period here. So for like April and May, we've got a list of some plants that we know are beneficial to pollinators, you know, our, our spring crocuses, our columbines, you know, our native pasque flower. We get into June and, you know, we've got other plants that are available like our baptisia. And then by the time we get into July and August, boy, oh boy, there's just a lot of plants to choose from. So we ask that people choose <clears throat> that they have a certain number of plants from each time frame, including fall. So we have to remember fall as being very important, like our asters and our sedums are so very important uh, for those last migrating monarchs. So in addition to, in addition to having plants uh, that bloom throughout the growing season, we also ask that you have some sort of water source. And the water source can be something as simple as a bird bath that has some pebbles sticking above the water surface, because the bees and the butterflies can land on the pebbles and then sip some water. But there are all sorts of water sources that you can have. And then lastly, we ask that people certify that they are using their pesticides wisely. And this is very important because we don't want people spraying either insecticides or fungicides on the flowers or when it's in bloom. So here's a photo of the free sign. It's an eight by eight inch sign. It costs us somewhere in the neighborhood of $10, but we think it's well worth it. And the reason we do this is so we can track the impact that we're having. So the people certify that they've got, uh, they've got so many pollinator plants in the right categories, and then we'll send them this free sign. And then we're able to track that we are making an impact. We've certified, you know, close to 240 gardens since this project started in 2016. We have gardens in North and South Dakota, Montana, and Minnesota. So any state that touches the border of North Dakota is welcome to participate. And it's okay if you've been certified by other organizations, that's not a problem. So if you want to have a free sign, you're certainly able to do this. So far, we've got 4.8 million square feet in new or retrofitted pollinator gardens. And that's the equivalent of 111 acres or 84 football fields. So we're so proud that we have created new habitat and inspired others to, uh, to create these gardens for our bees and our butterflies. Now, Shannon has done a wonderful job. So in addition, she had shown you a map of the teaching gardens. Now we've got maps for home pollinator gardens. Now we've still preserved privacy for individuals. So you'll see that we've got these little dots and the dots are for counties. So we say, okay, how many square feet? And let me see, I think I can show you that. So if you clicked on Montreal County, it would show that we've got 6,400 square feet of certified pollinator gardens that are maintained by homeowners. So the green dots are for the counties quantifying, you know, how much we have in private homeowner gardens. The yellow would be for public gardens. So these are gardens you could potentially visit in addition to our regular master gardener teaching gardens. This one happens to be the Lisbon Fire Department. And here, since there are no privacy concerns, we do provide the address. Shannon has done a wonderful, wonderful job in creating these, these Google Maps. <clears throat> We certify all kinds of gardens. As I mentioned, you don't have to be a private homeowner. You could be a nursing home or church. You know, we've got some individuals that have 
created meadow gardens like you see in the left hand side and that's just so so gorgeous <clears throat> there are others that have built small gardens you know so here's a uh, more like a foundation planting along the house, but they've still integrated the right types of plants and are providing an oasis for the bees. Now we have we moved into our third phase. In our third phase is we needed more information. We needed to know more about you know, more plants that we could be recommending. Um, so we started we started a research project and I have to tell you, I was inspired by McCrory Gardens in South Dakota. That's where I took this photo here on the left hand side. So that was my first time seeing a metal blazing star. And I was just astounded. I visited the, I visited South Dakota in August of 2015 and the butterflies were all over the <clears throat> um all over the meadow blazing stars. And this really confused me because I have grown an ornamental species, not native species of, of Liatris. So I've got cobalt on the right and I don't ever remember it attracting many pollinators. So that's what got me thinking, okay, there could be, there could be big differences between native and ornamentals. So we wrote a research grant. We applied for a specialty crop block grant where we were evaluating native species as well as ornamental species and cultivars. So we wanted to see, would they attract equal or greater numbers of pollinators? And we, we did our trial both in a rural landscape that was heavily wooded, and then also on campus in an urban setting. You'll see that there's a photo there of uh, Dr. Veronica Calez Torres. She was our postdoctoral researcher. Um, for those of you not feel familiar with postdocs, um, it's essentially an individual that has just received their PhD and they're doing a little bit of an internship before moving on to bigger and better things. Um, so Veronica was absolutely amazing and <clears throat> oversaw the project and then also some workers. What they did was we studied four genera of plants. We studied Baptisia, a common name, false indigo, Monarda or bee balm, or Helotelephium tall sedum, and then aster. So asters are now in the genus Symphiotrichum. So we looked at, you know, some native species. We looked at some ornamental cultivars, and then we had six of each of each plant at each location. Now Veronica and her her workers would sit by the plants for three minutes and observe all the bees and butterflies and other insects that would make contact with the plant. Now, if she was unable to identify them to species, just looking at them, she did capture them for, for identification. But uh, we're talking thousands and thousands of insects that were identified down to species. <clears throat> we were able to then you know, gather information and, and don't worry, I know this looks really, really busy here, but I'll try and break it down. Now on the, the y-axis or the vertical axis, we've got the average number of wild bees. This doesn't include honeybees. This is just the wild bee species and how many landed per plant on average. Across the x-axis, we've, we've got all of the, the plants that we tested. So the first group would be our Baptisia. We had some species and ornamental cultivars. We had uh, five cultivars of, of sedum from autumn fire to night embers. And then we had Monarda fistulosa and Monarda punctata, which are native species. And then uh, five different cultivars of Monarda from Grand Parade to raspberry wine. And then the last were native species of aster, as well as some of the ornamental cultivars. You'll see we have both blue and orange bars. The blue bars represent the number of bees that we captured in a rural landscape. The orange represented what we found on campus. But you can see that wild bees um, were visiting autumn fire and autumn joy and neon and night embers. Um, in the rural landscape in really great numbers. They also 
you know, they also went to Monarda Fistulosa, Grand Parade, Marshall's Delight, and Raspberry Wine. So we're seeing, you know, they sometimes go to native species, sometimes they go to ornamental cultivars. It was not a clear cut finding. But what's interesting is that, you know, we can identify some that are, are really, really attractive to wild bees. We did, did the same with <clears throat> Lepidoptera, which would be our butterflies and our moths. Once again, on the left-hand side, we've got the average number of butterflies and moths that made contact with each plant. And then, of course, the, plants, the plant species and cultivars across the bottom. But here, here, once again, we've got an ornamental cultivar, Autumn Fire and Autumn Joy and Neon. Um, in our rural landscape, we're attracting huge numbers of butterflies, as did Symphiotrichum novae angliae, which is um, our New England aster, a native species. And then there's Alma Pachki, uh, a cultivar of the native species. Now, I, I'm not going to overwhelm you with all the data, but I just wanted to show you, oops, sorry, <clears throat> our heat map. So our heat map um, I'm just showing you a tiny portion of it, and it's showing um, the different bee species in the Apidae family that were observed on the plants. So it's, this is just a tiny portion of them on the left-hand side. Going across the top, again, we have you know, the cultivars and native species. So you can see in the top bar, we've got Apis mellifera, which is the species name for our um, honeybee. And you can see our honeybee are generalists. They'll go to virtually anything, although they didn't seem to like purple mildew resistant. So you can see that, you know, the warmer the color, the more bee visits. You know, as we get down into bombus, bombus would be our bumblebees. You know, you've got some species that are generalists and will we'll go to many types of flowers. And then we have others that are more selective. They, they only want to go to certain, certain plants. So th this is just kind of fun to observe. Now, there's some people that think, oh, you know, uh, we're going to, going to uh, plant plants that attract, you know, multiple species um, and such. But there may be some plants that only attract a small number of species, but they're equally important because they're absolutely necessary for that species of bees. So we have to make sure that we take care of the specialists uh, as well as the generalists. Now, if you're interested in the research, you know, you're welcome to look at our, our peer-reviewed paper that's published in Hort Science. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's a really dense read. It's a really dense read. I mean, it's published more for scientists than it is for, uh, for master gardeners, but if you're interested in more results. But we've got, you know, new information, and then we'll be incorporating that back and back into our beautiful landscapes publication. So we've taken that publication down, and we're going to update the, the number of, of flowers that we have in there based on the new research that we have. All right, so I'm going to enable April here to finish out the talk here and she's going to talk about our final wave of pollinator projects. So April is fairly new to our project. Was it about a year, year and a half with us? Been a fantastic addition and she's our extension pollinator technician. Thanks Esther. Um, hi everybody. Yep, I'm the extension pollinator technician. My job is mostly public outreach regarding pollinator conservation. I do a lot of writing for this position and social media outreach and a lot of connecting with other people in the field, um, working on projects and working with master gardeners and all sorts of things. Um, I love my job. It's amazing. Click next. There we go. All right. Okay. So this is um, our Facebook page, and we're going to post a link for that in the chat. And you can like and follow us. We talk about a lot. We do a lot of talking about plants on that page and uh, pollinator conservation news. And you'll hear about upcoming publications from Extension regarding pollinators. And we have lots of fun over on that page. 
we have a new website that's in the works. Um, I think all of the pollinator stuff is up and the horticulture. Um, we're breaking away a little bit from the NDSU page and hosting our own NDSU extension horticulture information. Um, so we will keep you updated on the Facebook page if you're interested in uh, getting a heads up on when we will publi be publishing our website. But that's going to be our main audience is master gardeners, anybody interested in ornamentals, looking for advice on trees or different landscaping plants. We've got new publications coming up. We already mentioned this one. Um, this is the part one. There will be a part two, which is really exciting. Um, talks about designing monarch butterfly conservation gardens. We've done a bunch of research and come up with the criteria for designing a small, can be as small as you want, plot um, that will attract monarch butterflies and help sustain them throughout their developmental cycle. This is a little bit of a preview. This was out, this is a picture of kind of our sketch. We don't get to do, we don't, luckily we have people really talented that work for ag communications and they will be doing the design aspect of, but this is my, kind of our data, a little sample of it, of how we've organized our garden. Um, let's see. Oh, and the other really exciting project that we've worked on this last summer is we did some Monarch Monitoring Initiative training. So we had, I don't know the numbers of people that we had in our class, but there were many. And we did some project of data collection in the field for monarch monitoring, and I'll get into that in the, this next slide. We have training day one. We talked about monarchs and if they're endangered, why they're not listed on, on the endangered species list in the US, what kind of uh, environmental factors are um, affecting their population numbers. We talked about their life cycle, and we did a really fun little bit about the different lookalikes. There are several butterflies that have kind of that orange and black and white spotted coloring. And once you learn the tricks to tell them apart, it's really kind of a fun parlor trick to whip out like, oh, do you see that monarch butterfly? Well, actually, it's a viceroy. And then you get to tell your friends why that's the truth. We did some egg identification and how to identify the larval instars. That was really interesting. I got to do the training on that section and um again once you know the tricks it's kind of fun to be able to tell oh this is the fifth instar versus the second and they're all very distinctive once you know the steps day two we talked about different types of milkweed esther has a lot of information on um the cult the species and cultivars of milkweed that work best in different climates in different soil types um, in different gardens so if you've got a small garden which milkweeds work best as and they don't spread quite as rapidly and aggressively or if you've got a large space um, that works well with some of the different more aggressive milkweeds um we and and we talked also about some of the other content of a monarch garden you know the different nectar sources that the adults will use and then day three was the Monarch Monitoring Data Collection. This was the bulk of the project, which was training our volunteers to go out and collect three different types of information from a plot. And that's um, this next part is choosing the activity. And so everyone had to do a description of the monitoring site, size, location, and the content. And then um, most people chose one or the other, but you could do both. Milkweed density, which was calculating how many milkweeds were in that plot. Um, and then the monarch density, which was uh, going out several times and like looking for eggs on the plants, looking for larvae, looking for full adults visiting the, the plot. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is our monarch lar larva monitoring project, which is a partnership of Monarch Joint Venture and the U of Wisconsin Madison Arboretum. So this is a little map of the different areas that were monitored um, in the last two years. So it has expanded, which is really exciting. And I think we'll be continuing that project. Bee lawns is the other thing that's um, coming up. We've got our cute little bee lawn sign that coordinates with our certified pollinator garden sign. And we are in the final stages of actually uploading, polishing off and uploading our bee lawn application, just like we have our pollinator garden application. Right now it's an interest form and we'll drop that link in the chat if we haven't already and you can definitely get connected with that. Bee lawns are um, kind of a push to replace our 
grass lawns, which are pretty, but they don't provide any nectar or other resources to our pollinators and replacing it with a Dutch, this is Dutch white clover, replacing it with a clover lawn produces lots and lots of resources for pollinators and it's pretty and it stays green even in drought. And we all know living in this, in the Midwest, we can experience long periods of drought. Um, anyway, so bee lawns is really exciting. We've done a project this last summer where we handed out, is that update on the next page? Yes, it is. Okay, great. This is our clover distribution. This is a fun project that I start that I initiated. We we um we bought some Dutch white clover, repackaged it into bags that would cover a ten by ten square foot plot. Um, and turns out it's not a lot of seed to cover a ten by ten. So our promotion was to, um convince everyone to start with a smaller section. I mean, it's kind of a big commitment to go. I have, for instance, me personally, I have a 10,000 square foot lot in the city. And that is a big change to go from grass to 10,000 square feet of clover. Um, it's pretty dramatic. And I, you know, you wonder about how we, your neighbors perceive it, or is the clover going to get into the area, their yard? Well, our solution was to start with smaller plots. So we did the 10 by 10 square foot. And out of 20 pounds of clover, seed we got 700 bags that we shared um at different promotional events our field days um and we also gave a bunch of bags i think we gave out 400 of those or 500 of those bags at the red river valley fair at the master gardener booth at the 4-h master gardener booth so that was really fun it was exciting to see how many people were interested in trying out replacing some of their lawn with clover which is so countercultural. Anyway, it was just very exciting to see the participation. And next, next, there we go. Whoops. Uh oh. <laughs> I think we'll have to stop sharing here. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Did you have more to share, April? Um, Maybe I don't. <laughs> I can't remember what the last slide was. That was the last slide. That, that was no. okay. Then no, I don't think I did. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I guess what we want to say is that, um, <clears throat> and there's there's just so many different directions you can go with pollinator projects as a master gardener. It's just it, it's just a, a fabulous fabulous topic that you can expand to the masses. But we just wanted to show you how you know, how we did this and how we quantified it, because it's really gratifying to see that impact. And then, you know, you can certainly uh, show that to your legislators, because we, we certainly want the legislature to, in fact, um, support our programs. I have a question in the chat that I could answer about the bee lawn. Sure. Are we, I'm sorry, I should have said, are we moving to questions? But um <laughs> There's a question in there that says, can you seed a bee lawn over the top of a regular lawn? Absolutely, you can. In fact, that's what I'm going to do next year. You can choose to start with the bare plot, bare soil, and do your clover seeding, and that's that, that works. You can also, for instance, I'm going to rake a lot of the thatch that's piled up in the area that I'm going to use and loosen up the soil a little bit and then just overseed, and the clover will take over that spot. So either either option works really well. Great, thank you. Uh, another question was, do you work with local bee clubs? I don't know who wants to take that one. Um, I have connected with local bee clubs. I rarely ever turn down um, an option to go speak at anyone's event, uh, garden clubs, bee clubs. So that's been really fun. Part of my job is I do a lot of public speaking and I have met our local beekeepers club and they are fantastic and I love working with them. They've invite, been invited to and have participated in several of our other events through that connection. So um, yes, the answer is yes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know other <laughs> specific. What do I do with the local bee clubs? Chat. We chat and we make connections and we work on projects together. Well, and as April mentioned, we invited them to our camp, to our field days, so they would then have a venue in which they could also educate the public with respect to um, beekeeping. Great. Um, 
have a question from a few questions from Perry Johnson, uh, one of our master gardeners. He asked about controlling noxious weeds in an established it's a three three year old pollinator plot. Oh boy, uh, near it's in eastern South Dakota near Egan, and we've been using spot spraying of Roundup. Um, yeah. Any suggestions for, for that? And, and that's what we do. We do have a, a pollinator meadow garden on campus and we spot spray for Roundup because certain things do get out of control. We've also found, now we have the option of burning. So we do burn the pollinator garden. Or it's a pollinator meadow here on campus. So we have to get a, a burn permit, but I actually have a, uh, a flamethrower in our inventory, which for some reason seems to be a matter of pride for my daughter that I have a flamethrower. So that makes me a little bit cool. You know, the, the teenagers don't think I'm normally cool, but I've got a flamethrower. So it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and he mentions burning as well. We've done a spring burn and he's wondering if a fall burn might be more effective at reducing noxious weeds. I don't think it matters. I think we do most of our burning in spring um, okay. is what we've done. And is burning a problem for annual or perennial plants? No, it depends. If you have really, really early plants, plants that are going to, to come out, then yes, it's a little bit, it can be a little dicey, but I mean, we've burned and still had our prairie smoke come out um, and, and, and grow and bloom. So I, I do know that the earlier ones can be harmed a little bit more. So maybe maybe that's a better one where you do some of the burning in the fall. Okay. And then he asked about Black Hill spruce. Um, could that be reduced effectiveness? Could, sorry. Collecting winter snow be a positive of adding trees. What do you think about adding Black Hill spruce to a pollinator plot? <laughs> well, I don't necessarily know if Black Hill spruce is is a, a positive. There are some there's some plants that produce propolis, which is kind of a waxy substance. It's on the the leaf buds as they're opening up, and that's actually beneficial to them. I'm not sure if Black Hill spruce produces propolis, but the other thing to consider is that they would, bees would then have a place uh, of shelter. We have been discovering that trees are just very beneficial. You can see that we had our study done in the rural environment versus the urban environment. And the rural, envi the rural environment was heavily forested because it's actually our tree arboretum. And it just seems that the more trees you have, the better it is. Um, now, the one thing to worry about is shading. If you have a lot of pollinator plants that are full sun, you know, you don't want them to be shaded out. So that would be the consideration. So I don't think there's a problem in having trees, but you don't want to shade out your pollinator plants, you know, many of which are full sun plants. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, well, Shannon, <laughs> they asked about your beautiful spiral staircase. <laughs> We've got to know. <laughs> it's the uh I'm from Iowa originally and and this is the University of Iowa Law Library yeah I wish this was really my office <laughs> right uh, can a local master gardener club order clover seed to distribute at our plant sale is there a place to to order that and you it was Dutch Dutch clover Dutch white yep. clover that's right. right, Clover. I can find the link. I just ordered it off Amazon um, from a company. <laughs> Some people don't like Amazon. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> but that's just the truth. That's where I ordered it. Let's see. Um, I'll get that in a minute. You don't have to listen to me talk while I do it. And then there's also some on Twin City Seed. There's some people that like to buy a seed mix. So you've got the fine fescues in it uh, along with Dutch white clover. So it's not just 
just Dutch white clover. So you would definitely have some turf grass. Um, so Twin City Seed has various mixes and they start the base with the fine fescues because they're lower maintenance. So if you're gonna do something poller pollinator friendly, it makes sense that you would choose a grass that's low maintenance um, and doesn't grow as fast and doesn't require as much water and fertilizer. So I've, I've purchased from Twin City Seed for uh, our, our pollinator plots on campus. All right. Um, another question about burning. Let's see. If burning is not possible, can one mow down natives? Does plant material need to be removed? I have five acres of native grasses and forbs. All right. Do you want me to take that one? Yes. Yes, you can mow. And we've got individuals that mow. And it, it's good to do that before the invasive weeds set their seeds. So, you know, they start to flower, you can mow them off at that stage before the seeds mature. So that is definitely a possibility. And, you know, I would just, if you've got a, a mower that can chop it up a little bit better, I would just let it fall. Okay. Uh, we have a question from um, Jack French. Can you talk about no mow May? Okay. <laughs> So Prairie and I have talked loud. about this before. <laughs> I did a whole newspaper article on this because it, it, it's really interesting. Uh, there was a paper that came out of a, a college or university in Wisconsin where they were talking about if you didn't mow for the month of May, that you would have more dandelions and weeds that would produce flowers, which could be beneficial for insects. And yes, I mean, anytime you have flowers that are producing pollen and nectar, that is beneficial. However, the original study, which showed there was a benefit to this, was retracted because of a lot of errors in how it was done. So now we're starting to rethink no mo may, and then turf grass specialists aren't necessarily fond of no mow may because it actually weakens your turf grass because anytime that you allow grass to grow to 10 or 12 inches and then, then you mow it down to three inches, you're actually hurting the grass. Anytime you remove more than a third of the leaf blade, that is going to stress the turf grass. So I, I would say that maybe the better thing to do rather than you know, neglecting your lawn for the month of May is plant a pollinator garden or plant a dedicated um, clover lawn. Those tend to be a little bit better. Um, the other thing is dandelions. Yes, dandelions can be somewhat beneficial, um, but they've done studies showing that some dandelions don't produce the necessary amino acids for bumblebees. Um, so it isn't as, as good as we had initially thought. Um, so a lot of controversy. I know communities were adopting it, but then with the initial study being retracted for numerous, numerous errors, we're starting to rethink the no mow may. I still think building a pollinator garden is a little bit better than, you know, just, just doing this. But also, you know, so you attract all the bees with your no mow lawn in May. What happens when you cut it all down in June? There's, there's nothing left. Thank you, yeah. And uh, someone in the chat point, pointed out that um, Dr. Christine Lang has given out um, some clover seeds or cover crop. I think she has a cover crop mix and I can certainly ask her about that and what she'd recommend um, for our area. Uh, we gave out some at the Harvest Festival um, near Rapid City last year and there's, um, and they said, thank you. Those are some great alternatives. No mo may recommend getting a pollinator garden instead. I'm not sure about the um, sumac question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they're asking if, is sumac a, a pollinator plant or? I haven't read about sumac. April, have you? No, not in particular. I think they're cool plants. I love tiger eyes, but I just don't, I guess I don't know. And maybe it hasn't been studied. 
if you're looking for tree species that um, support a lot of pollinators as far as either nectar, pollen, or shelter, you can enter your zip code in um, Nash, uh, National Wildlife Federation web service website. They have a plant finder. Um, and for our area, it's oaks and willows, aspen, poplar, and birch. Those are the five best trees as far as they, the list will rank them, rank the, the, the tree or shrub or, or perennial by, they'll give it a number system and the top one will say 153 or something. And that'll be your best tree or shrub option for how many insects it supports. Um, so that's a really cool way to just check your your area because I'm not sure you're you probably don't have exactly the same list as up here in Fargo so oh I'm, tr I'm trying to remember the name of that researcher that that built that oh oh he's out of Delaware or Maryland so yes hmm. he did uh Doug T was it Doug Tellamy April oh that is a name that sounds familiar yeah he's yeah yeah, Doug telling me, and he's so cool because he didn't just study pollinators, he studied insects because he's very concerned about bee species. So we heard him speak at the National Extension Master Gardener Conference in, in Council Bluffs a number of years ago. And he was talking about um, the number of insects and caterpillars that a mother and father bird had to bring to raise to successfully raise one one chick mm. so one bird so he's been really good about quantifying he's an ecologist been really good at um, quantifying which trees will in fact you know produce insects that will be necessary for birds so i think that may be part of of what april is mentioning which is really fascinating too So yeah, the poor guy sat in and actually counted how many caterpillars that <laughs> the parent birds brought to the babies and figured out how much was necessary to raise one baby chick all the way to adulthood. And it was just crazy, just really crazy. But yeah, oaks were like number one when it came to producing the types of insects that were necessary for nourishing our birds. Um, Sorry, there was one more. There was a question way up at the top about okay. the data uh, slides. Mm -hmm. And on the graphs we above the columns, there was oh, A, okay. B, C, D, E. What, what did those represent, Esther? Yes, that re represents statistics. Um, so I didn't want to get too into the weeds, but since you asked, um, the ones that have an A tend to have greater numbers. Um, so anything that's listed as A would be statistically significant from those that are B, but then you'll notice that some are A, B, and C. So there's there would be no difference between say one that had A listed on it and one that had A, B, C. So if there's overlap, it's not a statistically significant difference. Um, stats is really, really complicated. And I didn't want to go into that, but you could see which ones had higher peaks and those tended to be better. And those tended to start with A. You know, we get down to some that were really low and they were D. So something that's listed as A or AB or ABC is going to be much statistically significantly different than D. I probably butchered that, but, <laughs> but that's what it means. I, I didn't want to go too into the weeds, but when we do research, we have to do statistical analysis. And I mean, you may, we've got people that may spend an entire month just doing stats on a project before they publish it and write it up. Thanks for catching that, April, um, that question. And I was just very validated that I added sedum to my garden. So <laughs> by your presentation, so yay. Um, and then we have another question. Overall, were the bees more attracted to native plants than the ornamental? I think you said it was mixed, but. It was mixed. It was very mixed and it depended on the location too. Um, so I say plant plant a variety of things. Um, I, I think that that's kind of the key is 
the more diversity you can have, the better. Um, that really seems to be the key. But I, I think it's important to have both natives and ornamentals in a pollinator garden. I wouldn't just do all or ornamentals. The native species did co-evolve with our native pollinators. So we do want to make sure there's some of that. But I didn't see things that were necessarily clear cut in ours. Um, now with the asters, I think New England aster um, was one of the better ones, because, and that's a native one. Um, and and there, were, there were some cultivars that were absolute duds. Um, so you would be able to see that in our research study, but I can't make a broad generalization because it's it's really crazy. It's almost like we need to do this study with every every species and every cultivar that we have because there can be significant differences. We had two two monarda that were cultivars that looked very similar color wise. One was just horrible at attracting butterflies, and the other one was wonderful. So. I think there, there's a lot of room for research, but it, it's almost like you have to go cultivar by cultivar and, and see how they compare. Mister, do we know if bees can smell? Um, boy, oh boy. Like maybe if things are close to the same color, one just smells bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm not an entomologist. April, do you, I mean, how? Do well, they don't, they don't smell the same way we do. Their olfactory senses aren't in a, in nostrils um, because they don't breathe through their faces. They breathe through, um, I forget what they're called, but basically receptacles on their abdomen. But some insects taste with their feet and there's some, there's some sensation of, um, taste and smell are so close. So there's some sensation on the antennas as well, picking up those kind of sensory. So yes and no. <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah. Um, one, someone asked, how can I utilize um, your pollinator program uh, she has established a pollinator garden three years ago in eastern South Dakota as a master gardener. And how how could she interact with your program? Well, she's welcome to download any of our uh, any of our materials. Now, B beautiful landscapes. I am in the process of working with April to update that. So that one's actually down right now. But we'll have everything up by spring. If you wanted, you could certainly lead tours of your garden, you could you could apply for a pollinator sign, but as a master gardener, you could use it as an educational resource, invite your garden club, invite, invite others to come and learn, and they would tour your garden. Um, I, I think that would be a potential. So, I mean, you've got a learning environment right in your backyard, which is amazing. Can, can you remind me the amount of funding that your teaching pollinator gardens received? The amount of funding? Yes, we start off with, with 500, but boy, oh boy, there's been a lot of inflation. So we're up to 750 now, which can buy quite a few plants. I mean, it, it's not going to build a huge, huge garden, but it, it'll mm -hmm. buy a certain number of plants and, you know, hoses and, and mulch and such. And then with the uh, refresher, grants they can apply for $150 you know each year to refresh the garden you know and add some annuals or top off the mulch um do you have time for a few more questions i know shannon you need and to April get going have to go, but i i can stay on so the two of them have appointments and and okay. such but i can stay on well thank you so much shannon and april thank you it was great to be here Yep. Yeah, Thanks okay. for having me so much. <laughs> All right. Just a couple more that I see. Um, and, okay. Is the number of individuals that visit a plant indicative of preference or could there be something else going on? Also, the difference between urban and rural does it have something to do with the abundance of insects? Okay, 
Um, so I'll start off with the first one. Okay. You know, the number of visits, yes, that is that is indicative. And that was in the first couple of graphs that I showed. Um, so that was quite helpful just to show pollinator preference. You know, if they're not visiting a plant, you know, there's usually some reason why they're not visiting a plant. You know, maybe it's not pro producing nectar or the pollen that they need, or it's just not beneficial to them, doesn't have the right amino acids. So yes, the number of visits is important, but at the same time, um, I mentioned there were specialists that only went to certain plants, you know, and they would only visit, you know, one or two species of what we had there. Um, so there weren't as many, many visits going on there, but I still think that plant was very important, you know, based on the fact that it was nourishing a particular pollinator that, that didn't want to go to the other plants. The other thing I didn't mention was timing. So we didn't get as many bees that were visiting the Baptisia, so the Baptisia bloom in June, and we don't have as many bees that are around in June because, you know, they've got all these different life cycles when they emerge, you know, a lot, a lot of times in June, early June particularly, um, you've got just like the queen bees that are out. But that doesn't mean that Baptisia is not beneficial. It just, th there were fewer bee species that were foraging. So it's a complicated picture because, you know, we've got the Baptisia blooming in June, not as many bees that are out there, but I'd still say plant Baptisia because it does benefit some of the early bees, but you're not going to see the numbers. So it, the story can be very complicated. And I think the second part of that question was asking, is there, do rural environments have a greater abundance of insects than urban? Now we only studied two environments. Um, so we can't definitively say, now, if we'd had more workers and such, we, we could have done, you know, multiple gardens. Um, now, just between NDSU campus and um, our rural location, which was at the Arboretum, there was a clear preference. I mean, it was, it was pretty clear that there were more species, different species of bees and butterflies that were there. And, you know, I, I would say anecdotally, it's due to the fact that there are a lot of trees and it's just a non-disturbed environment, you know, and um, Vero found this great map showing how much paved surface is there, you know, and structures. So out at the Arboretum, there's hardly anything around. It's like 3%, you know, surface area where buildings or paved surfaces. While on campus, it was like 80, 90%. Um, so I think in general, maybe we can say that rural is better just because um, there's just more area, more food, you know, more greenery and shelter, but I can't say it definitively based on this one study. And we mentioned sedum, but are there other good fall flowers for providing nutrients for pollinators? Yes. Yes, I absolutely recommend all sorts of different asters. We had, you know, several species of aster. I was a little disappointed in one of them because I was all pumped to promote, was it purple, purple dome? There's purple dome out there that's in the trade. It's an ornamental, you know, and it's what I liked about it is it's shorter and compact would fit really nicely into a garden. But in our study, we had an early, early fall killing frost. So our purple domes had just started to bloom and then frost came along. Mm -hmm. Well, purple dome is strongly recommended by like the Cincinnati Zoo for pollinators. And they've got a, a great pollinator program there. It didn't do well for us in North Dakota, at least in, in years where things freeze in early October. Um, now in other years, it could do well. But for us, you know, we had a couple couple of years where fall came really early and it didn't do well. Um, but I, I still think that a lot of the other asters, we had October skies. It kind of looks a little bit like a spirea bush, but as an aster, that one did quite well for us. Um, we had, oh, smooth blue aster, which is a native species. That did well. New England aster, 
uh, Amapachki, which was a cultivar of the native species, um, those were really important for the mo migrating monarchs. So absolutely love, 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 you know, the asters. You know, anytime, anytime you can have something blooming till the very end of the season, it's going to be beneficial. I've got an aster don't, at home, don't know the cultivar, um, but it's the last thing blooming on the block. And if we get warm days, the bees are out. Mm. So aster and sedum are kind of the big, the big ones for the fall. Um, what were the others? I think we had, let me just check my reference here. We were also recommending, there's, there's a form of goldenrod. I can't remember if it was stiff or gold or zigzag goldenrod that doesn't spread. Is not rhizomatous, and that can be very good in fall too. Okay. And we do have this little book available at a lot of our um, at our extension offices. It's you probably can't see it very well. Native pollinator plants of South Dakota for managed landscapes. Um, that might be in it a good resource if you don't have that book. Pick up. And uh, one other question I see uh, is, do you have pollinator education for children? Uh, we had like a PowerPoint um, that was available. It was designed by actually one of our extension agents. And it was really cool because they were using a bowl of, oh, what was it? Like cheese balls to, to <laughs> show pollination. So there was a whole exercise using you know, using these cheese balls where you had to go fish for some candy. And, you know, it, so we, we do have some curriculum like that. April's been, you know, designing some curriculum too. Um, so if I find that I could send that off to Prairie, but it was kind of nice for like those five, six, seven year olds uh, just to demonstrate, you know, what happens for pollination, mm -hmm. how you can drag that orange Cheeto dust all over. <laughs> yeah, very visual, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I hope I didn't miss any questions. I think I got them. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time and your, your partnership in other areas. Um, I think we all learned a lot. So thank, thank you so much, Hester. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you. It's been fun collaborating with you. And I got to see a lot of names here that took the Master Gardener Diagnostician course. So fun to see familiar names. So happy yeah. Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Bye, everyone.